bit of a different webinar actually from our from our normal monthly webinar. Um, we usually have uh, uh, we usually have a a, um, a presentation, a slide presentation. But it's not appropriate to have a slide presentation for this because this is more of a, a question and answer session. So this is uh, we've, we've just got two slides for this, which I'm going to put on in just a second. Um, and then after that, you're actually going to be able to see our faces. And we're going to have a discussion. So we're going to openly talk about the changes to service accommodation and what difference that makes for you. So if you've already got service accommodation, um, what do you need to look out for? What are the new rules exactly? Uh, what does that mean for you for operating that service accommodation? Are there are there going to be any any additional hurdles that you need to jump over? Or if you're um, if you're thinking about getting into service accommodation, then looking at it from the other way. What are these new rules and therefore what do you need to put into place so that you can uh, compliantly operate serviced accommodation? So without further ado, let me just go straight to the couple of slides that we do have. So this is all about serviced accommodation. Like I said, it's uh, quite unusual for us to do a, to do a webinar like this that, that is based on one specific strategy. Um, and service accommodation it is. Now, the reason that we've chosen this to do uh, right now is, uh, well, a couple of reasons, really. First of all, service accommodation has been the strategy for a lot of people to get into property over the last couple of years. It's been very, very popular from, uh, and there's a couple of good, re really good reasons for that. One, you can use it with rent to rent. So don't worry if you don't know what rent to rent is. We're not going to go into that in a lot of detail today. But basically, rent to rent is a low barrier to entry to get into property to operating property to making profit from property the second reason that service accommodation has been so popular is because of, it, it increases the amount of money that you can turn over from that property so instead of making you know a thousand pounds worth of buy to let income from renting the property out to a family for the month if you use it as service accommodation you could potentially increase that amount of money that you're making from that property so you could be up to you know two thousand three thousand perhaps even more if you've got your sums right. And to help me out with this uh, with this conversation is our resident service accommodation expert here at Sourced HQ, and that is Victoria Hampson. Um, and she is the head of the network. So she her, she, her task uh, within Sourced is to look after all of our franchisees, to make sure that they're following the process, to make sure that they're getting as much value as they possibly can from the training material, from the support team, from Source Capital, our in-house funder, um, and to, to basically her task is to make sure that our guys, part, the, the people that are part of our community are as successful as they can be. So she's going to be on it. Now, she's got a big background when it comes to service accommodation, but I'm going to let her talk to you a little bit about that. Um, now, I'm going to uh, allow her to talk, obviously, because you want to hear from her. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to give you a bit of a bit of a background into me. So my name's Chris Kirkwood. I'm the managing director. There's a picture of me, but you're actually going to see me in a minute just to just to prove that we um we don't use uh, fake pictures. I mean, look at the picture. It's not that great anyway. So why would we use that one if it was if it was going to be fake? Um, but uh, I'm the managing director of Sourced. So uh, I've been with Sourced since almost the very beginning for six years now. And we have grown this uh, this structure, this this strategy that we created, where we want to help as many people as possible be successful in property. We've grown that now to a place where we've got uh, just over 200 franchisees operating around the country. Uh, we've got a team here at HQ of about 25 people, and we are all tasked with making sure that the franchisees are more successful than they had been before they joined Source. So, uh, without further ado. Now this might go wrong here, so I'm just just giving you a warning. But I'm going to allow Victoria to talk now. So I've just clicked the button. So Victoria, if you want to say something, just to confirm that you're there. And uh, no, I can't hear anything. So I'm just going to uh, click on another button and see if that works for Victoria. Okay, Victoria, can you say, tell me if you're I there? I should be able to speak. Yes, there you are. Brilliant. Okay, um, fantastic. So. Do you want to give us a bit of a background into yourself and into your service accommodation and, and uh, into what you actually do on a day to day basis with Source? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can see from my name that I am flashing up as Rory Kenny. Um, so I am the technical delay on this. I was struggling to access the webinar. Um, so, yes, Chris is right. My background is in um, 
short term accommodation. So before moving to Sourced uh, towards the back end of 2023, I worked for Sykes Holiday Cottages. So obviously very specific within the industry um, with regards to short term accommodation, holiday lets, essay, whatever you, whatever you, however you wish to refer it to. Um, so a lot of responsibility in, in so my, my team was responsible for being armed with all of the knowledge with regards to legislation, as uh, if some of you have already been operating in the industry, you'll understand that uh, initially uh, the short term accommodation sector was always um, quite light. It wasn't regulated uh, in any way, shape or form. The, that landscape has changed over the last few years, specifically since COVID. So there's a lot more movement um, in terms of the regulations, obviously, with uh, that is uh that's different across the different countries that comprise of the UK as well. So there's lots to understand and learn, and hopefully we'll be able to give you some guidance during this Q&A on to how, what these changes are, what's currently in place and what will impact you. Fantastic. All right, then. So uh, just to make it clear for everybody that's uh, that's watching, that's listening, if you, you should have access to a menu bar. Uh, that menu bar um, will give you the option of a Q&A and a chat. If you've got any questions throughout this webinar, please put them in the Q&A section. If you put them in the Q&A section, it means that we have to answer that before we move on. If you put them in the chat, I might miss those questions. So please don't put your questions in the chat. Please put any questions that you have in Q&A. Feel free to put your questions in there as we're going through the webinar. Um, and we'll probably uh, get to them at, at the end. Um, but if you think of a question, please put it in the Q&A section and we'll, we'll address them uh, right at the end of the webinar after we've done the update and shown you how you can continue to make money from serviced accommodation. Now, uh, I might have misled you earlier on. I said that I was going to show our faces, but because of the technical problems that we're having, uh, I'm probably just going to leave this slide on. So you can see a still image of who is talking to you this afternoon. Um, so uh, apologies for that, but otherwise you're just going to be looking at the blank S. So I'm being a bit presumptuous that you would rather look at our faces, even in the still, than looking at, the, looking at the, the S. So I've saved ourselves there, but um, I think actually you'd only be looking at me, which is even worse for you. So um, Victoria, like you just mentioned, you've got different different part, parts of the UK, different countries in the UK that are, have got different rules. So in order to um, go through this logically, should we break it down into country first um, and then explain what's happening in that country? And then, then we'll deal with another country and then we can see what the differences are between the ways that the countries are dealing with that dealing with uh, solving the problem that they see is there. Is that a logical way for you to go forward? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, because some of, uh, the, specifically in Scotland, there's some legislation that's already been been in place for some time. So, yeah, however okay. you want to go from the top. We have had some already uh, pre-submitted questions. So that will give us a good basis to to launch from. Yes. Uh, and because I'm sharing my sharing this screen with our images on, I can't see those pre uh, pre registered questions. So you might have to uh, announce them at the end. So just to, just to let you know, so you can prep for that uh, or maybe one of the team there can hand them to you. So, um, first of all, let's deal with the, you know, the inception of all of these changes that have been proposed. So, first of all, why? What has provoked the government to to uh, a legislation change quite as drastic as they're proposing. What has been the the driving factor behind that? So let's start there. Yeah, I, th I think there are a number of reasons for it. Uh, as as I said, some of you may have already been operating within the industry for some time, uh, and I touched on earlier that it's 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 been an unregulated industry. Uh, that's come with some positives. That's also come with some negatives. Um, so short term accommodation has always flown under the radar of legislation. Um, I think specifically since COVID, um, obviously it was it was brought more to the forefront. So the uh, sort of challenges with with the customer and owner um, sort of refunding situation. So as well, there isn't any sort of register of compliance so there's rules and regulations in place with regards to health and safety requirements for short-term accommodation but there's no accountability for that um in addition uh, and obviously depending on where, where your property may or may not be uh, there are obviously high saturated areas within the uk uh for example you know if you look at those high density areas Windermere, uh, some areas of the northeast, Whitby down in Cornwall, uh, significant saturation in, in terms of short term accommodation uh, that 
local councils want to try and address for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, to release any housing stock back into the market if there's the opportunity to. Uh, if they've got uh, challenges with housing demand, um, specifically, and I know we'll touch on in individual countries later on, um, but for example, in Wales, one of the challenges that they've had in some areas is that people have second homes uh, that aren't letting those properties out. So they're actually not contributing to any local economy. But again, there's no visibility of that within how um, the short term accommodation sector is managed. Um, in the last few, sort of the last 10 years specifically, there's been a massive shift in digital listing platforms. So we've gone from sort of, you know, very local, small businesses potentially in those high density areas to Airbnb, where the access to the market is so easy now um, for either individual properties or rooms within your own home. Uh, there's so much scope across the industry uh, and there's so there's so little accountability as I said for how people are operating and as much as we wouldn't like to say it there are people that uh, might not be as reputable as others and they might be you know inferring substandard properties into the market which you know this legislation ultimately wants to overcome um, and it, so it is a case of as a top line what, what are the reasons behind the license well the reasons uh, put for the the reason for it put forward is because um they need to flush out the poor standard and you know non-compliant properties and those people that are operating those and it needs to give um local authorities visibility of how the properties are being used within the area so that's pretty much an overview of of why the license has been uh, and the, this is specifically for the English license as well, but that does sort of transcend the different um, the different rules that are in place across Wales and Scotland too. I think this that that's what makes this problem so unique because there there is a there has been a problem previously with HMO and um, the you know people converting properties to HMOs and the government wanted to keep to create a control measure on that so they could choose the local councils could choose where HMOs went. Now that tended to be in um city center areas so it was it was you know those high density areas that you talk about that's where the problem was and service accommodation has become a, an issue in the high density areas but as you you reference windermere you also reference wales and i know in north wales that's it's particularly a problem of the second homes so you've got this this service accommodation sort of uh spreading that people are people are turning their their properties into service accommodation across the country and it doesn't discriminate, you know, whether you're in a high density area or a low density area, whether you're in the countryside, whether you're in a national park, whether you're, it doesn't really matter. Um, service accommodation has sort of perforated every part of the UK because it is a way of increasing the amount of money that you make from a property. And that's why it's become so popular. So it's a, it's a kind of unique problem that they've had to fix with this. And I guess that's one of the reasons why it's taken so long for them to fix this problem and to come up with the the, the right way that they see that they're going to move forward. So with service accommodation, um, let's deal with Scotland first, shall we? And then we'll move to England afterwards. Do you want to talk about the, the way that the Scottish government are proposing to solve the problem and create a measure of control so they can decide whether a unit can, can be used as service accommodation or not? Yeah, absolutely. So some people on this webinar may already have um, short term accommodation properties in Scotland. Uh, if you do, I'm sure you'll have been through, jumped through all of the hoops that you needed to get through. Um, so Scotland, uh, a couple of years ago now, um, introduced their own licensing system. Um, with this, uh, as an overview, it gave each local council the uh, authority to um, issue licenses to properties that were being used as short-term accommodation so what if you were existing uh, if you're generating revenue from a property as short-term accommodation you would apply to your local council and they would e initially issue you with uh, a provisional license um, and then if they then agreed that, yes, the property could be short term accommodation on a permanent basis, then they would issue you with a full license. That sounds very straightforward. In the grand scheme of things, it was a bit of a nightmare. I'm sure they'd probably hold their hands up and say the same thing. So 
it was not a it, it is not a standardized process across the uh across the country each council has their own way of assessing it's had their own way of implementing it they do have the criteria that you you need to apply with which i will touch on because i think as part of the um the registration scheme that comes in in england i think this will be mirrored with what happens in scotland but essentially with what happened in scotland sorry but i think with with the scottish law they sort of did it in a proactive way so people had to apply uh, which obviously is time consuming so the reason for the scottish license was because they did have a lot of issues with housing stock in areas such as central edinburgh central glasgow uh, especially when things like edinburgh fringe were on and they they did not have any control over how these properties were being used and you know there was there was a big impact there but ultimately the way that they um they implemented it it wasn't a great system and i think that wales and england looking at how scotland managed that um have, have taken stock of the challenges um so have they changed is... that system in it in any way since since they implemented no. it is it is it the same now as it had been and in, in, in yes. if not then what have they done yes it's it's the same um the only changes that and I won't, I won't go into the detail of it but essentially they had to kick it down the road a fair few times because the delays I think even now you know you could be looking six months potentially up to a year to get a confirmed decision on top of sort of that initial uh, provisional license that you give them so with the Scottish system it is very robust if you apply for a license it's it's applicable for three years if you're granted it but it's applicable to the property and to the owner so if you are operating short-term accommodation in that area and you want to sell your property the new owner of that property cannot take on any aspect of that license they will then need to wait for the sale of the property to complete before they then apply for their own license so it's that, doesn't... that sounds that sounds unnecessarily punitive right to, yeah. to have to wait for the to have to wait for the the property to complete you know once you've gone through exchange you're, you're committed to buying that property what I, do you do you know what the logic is behind them making the the new owner wait until completion before they apply for the license i i assume it's just to make the process more challenging um so it's it's the process that they have in place um equally if for example you have a, a property that you've built on a piece of land and you have a license for that property, you cannot assume a license if you go ahead and build an exact replica of that property next door. You still have to go through the application process. Mm -hmm. um, equally, if the property is owned by, say, Chris, you and I owned a property, it was under joint ownership. If, I, if, if that ownership changed and the property went into your sole ownership, you would then need to start the application process for the license again so it's it's very um it's very robust um it's very it's been very time consuming i imagine for the councils as well because they have to they they're the ones that have to implement this um but actually i think using that as a bit of a test bed it's it's sort of paved the way for potentially what what the registration scheme will look like in the uk now with the, uh, sorry in england the registration scheme for england could we is, just before we get always... there before we go into the reg registration scheme can i just ask you a question about the license in scotland yes i've not finished about the license in scotland okay great yet, okay I was great just gonna... <laughs> I was just going to say that it's always been pitched as being light touch in inverted commas. That's that's even how it's re referenced on the government website. So there's an absolute difference there in terms of what we can expect into, you know, with regards to how it's implemented, how it's assessed, what you need um, as an owner and how, you know, how how you manage that. OK, um, so with that, with that license, is there a cost? Uh, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, I'm not 100% certain on that, Chris. I okay. haven't been made aware of any cost. I haven't heard of any cost, but I can't say that that's the case. But ultimately, if that's a question, I can take that away and, and find that answer. If yeah, okay. it is, it, it may be applicable per council. Um, the councils have to advertise, I say advertise, they have to display on their website any applications and any rejections. So... If you are wanting to operate in Scotland, obviously this is a deterrent. This is ultimately a deterrent for people operating within the uh, 
operating short-term accommodation in the area, but there's good visibility there of any properties that have been accepted, any that have been rejected. So it'll give you a good guide on where the sort of thought processes are. Yeah. When I was in my in my previous role, I think we'd only known of one property that had been rejected across all of the applications that we were made aware of. So it may be the case, and it, it, it may be the case, I'm not saying it is, but if there's a density scenario where they're taking these applications and actually then they hit a limit, you're better off, you know, sort of getting involved now and applying as soon as possible because if there's opportunity there and ultimately there is opportunity because uh, with this a number of people um dropped out of the industry because it's it's time consuming it's legislation it's processes equally for the same reason that it's being brought into england is that it's flushing out non-compliant properties and again I'll, we'll go into what they need to be compliant but it's getting rid of all of those from the industry but actually it, it's not impacted the demand the demand from the consumer is still there so in terms of opportunity there was there is absolutely still opportunity in Scotland and arguably potentially more uh, given that there is less uh, property available to service those needs of the consumer um in Scotland, uh, we've talked about licensing. And let me just say, I asked that question about licensing sort of a little bit tongue, tongue in cheek because I've never known a council put something like licensing in place without taking up the opportunity to charge for that, for that privilege to have that license. So uh, we might not know the detail of that right now. And I agree that it's probably going to be by, by individual council to determine what fee that will be. But I would be very surprised if there was no fee for that for that service in Scotland. So that's licensing in Scotland. Um, is there any change to the planning system for service accommodation in Scotland? Uh, so in um, th there is uh, specific, and again, it's um, quite. It's not been as forthcoming as it it will be in England, um, but the Highland Council. Uh, does require planning for any short-term lets uh, in in some areas of the Cairngorms. But what's what's important to note in Scotland is that planning and the licence are two separate entities. Which again, I think Chris is going to say that's ridiculous. But <laughs> if you have planning, that doesn't assume you have a licence because again, you, the property owner, needs to apply for that. Mm -hmm. And that just is, enough just an opportunity for the for two different parts of the council to be to be able to charge you because you've got your licensing which is probably going to be activated by the the housing department of the council and the planning which is obviously controlled by the planning department of the council and if you've got to do both of those things then both of the, those different departments of the council make make revenue from from what you're doing um yeah okay so that is so it sounds like the planning isn't a, a a national thing in scotland it's just in some areas is that correct or is that not correct as as far as i'm aware yes but i would say that if you do have a property in scotland you still need to follow your, your own due diligence and check with your local council and don't forget any... as well that this is this is a moving situation right this is this is something that they put into place and i think in scotland they did it they were a little bit hasty about the way that they did it without actually thinking about uh, the way that it should be done a little bit longer. It, again, in Scotland, it was put back when it was first announced. I think it was August last year and it was put back from August last year because they hadn't they hadn't they didn't have the right legal framework in place in order to support these changes. Now, um, this is the situation as we talk about it today, which is the uh, 3rd of April 2024. Now, there, there is going to be an evolution to this process. There's going to be evolution to this uh, on an ongoing basis. So, you know, that that piece of advice of if you've got a property in an area, then check with your local council. That is always going to be relevant because, you know, uh, legislation changes all the time. So in order to stay up to date, checking with your local council is the best uh, the best thing that you can do. Right here, we're talking about sort of national government uh, uh, coming up with rules and regulation and then uh, delegating that to the local authorities for then the local authorities to decide what they want to put into place or not. So with that said, let's move on to England and see what's what's different in England and how have England learned from the mistakes that Scotland made 
and made the process so much easier and slicker and better. So let's first of all talk about the license or in England, do we have a license? So in terms of, I, th I think England has taken um, sort of big guidance from what's happened in Scotland. Uh, you know, as as I said, and as, as Chris touched on, it was delayed, it was pushed back, it was moved on down the road because the various different reasons, but ultimately it wasn't a good example of how um, legislation like this could be executed. Um, England is going to be a little bit different, which is beneficial to you because ultimately I think they want to make the process a bit smoother. As I said, in inverted commas, light touch is the uh, is sort of the phrase of the moment that's being used to describe it. So there isn't uh, a licensing scheme as such that's being presented by the government. There is a mandatory national register uh, where you will have to register your property as a uh, short-term accommodation, which sounds pretty straightforward. And the reason I wanted to explain about the Scottish system is because the requirements for the application for the licence, um, it's highly likely that the information provided will be needed to, add, to be added to the mandatory national register. So I will just quickly touch on this. And again, this is applicable for Scotland, but it would potentially lead into what is requested for in England. So we can follow up with this separately if, if people don't have a pen and paper to hand. Uh, but at the minute, and what, what you should have as part of your property to ensure that you're compliant um, for the most part is annual gas safety check, um, electrical inspection report. In Scotland, they require um, a PAT test Currently, it's not a legal requirement in England, although it is recommended that you do have one. Uh, private water supply certificate, if you have private water supply for the property. Um, in Scotland, you require a Legionella risk assessment. Um, and then the uh, fire safety check, so a fire safety assessment. And that needs to be completed by somebody that is competent to do so. If your property is uh, relatively straightforward, you know, it might be a three bedroom property if it's something that's a bit more unique it's got uh, more than a couple of floors or it might be you know a relatively unique building uh, grade two listed uh, you'll need to get somebody in to support you with that assessment um, and then you need to be correctly insured as well so you need to have buildings insurance and public liability insurance now as part of the license application for Scotland those are those are what you need along with the EPC certificate as well which currently isn't requested for in England so, so I, have, I have one question about the register. So the, uh, the mandatory reg register is pr present or proposed? This will be implemented. So this is it's they've gone through the consultation. So this is what will this is what will come into place. Right. OK, so and again, we're using using the structure for the license application in Scotland to um, assume what might be requested as part of the register, because it forms if. The government are implementing this for compliance. What they're asking for is your documents to show that you're compliant. Yeah. And again, even though that's what is required today, all of the local councils, when they enforce this registration, can, cho can choose to add additional features that you need to show that you have in the property in order to... Um, uh, in order to operate it as service accommodation, right? This is not the definitive list forever. They can they can make it much more difficult for you to meet the, the details of that registration if they so wish, right? Potentially, yeah. I mean, the list isn't the the list is assumed. There's nothing the the government have been quite cautious on the information that they've released, uh, which I think is causing people, you know, some some anxiety, some frustration because they haven't said what the register will comprise of. However, if we're looking to how, how it's been implemented previously, as in Scotland, they're asking for compliance documents. The reason that the government is saying that this is being implemented is so that, you know, properties and property owners are compliant. So there's the assumption there that what will form part of the register is the property address and the compliance documents. So mirror the information that's needed. So if you have all those documents in order to register that registration, you know, it sounds like when, when you use the word registration rather than a license, you're not really applying to register, you're putting your details down. And so long as you have all the right details, 
then that is not it doesn't sound like that that's something that the, the the council can say no you can't register if you've got all those details it sounds like you will be able to register and then and because and the reason that i'm asking this is because i'm coming on to planning permission um yeah. and the the planning permission changes that are being proposed so do you want to talk about them and then we'll we'll tie registration and the planning permission together at the, after you've done that yeah yeah absolutely um so as chris said um there is a register so people will regardless of what documentation is required people will have we people will, re will register any property that is operating as a short-term let they will also be given planning permission so any property that's currently operating as a short-term let there is a new um short-term sorry there's a new planning class for short-term let uh, that's being introduced as part of this legislation called C5. And, and that will... there we go. I, I was going to say for the more technical people in, on, in the room, what is that planning co code? But it's C5. So C3 is normal residential. C4 is HMO. C5 is uh, service accommodation or short term let, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that will be implemented alongside of this. Um, so any um, any short-term accommodation that was sort of operating before these legislation changes come into place will be transferred to the new C5 planning class and that will give them permitted development rights so it's 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 almost the reverse of how Scotland have done it so they're saying is it already operating brilliant there you go you've you know we're assuming that everything's in order you've provided us with all of your compliance potentially you've advised us that this is how the property is being used uh we will move your property into c5 and you will be given permitted development rights any new property <clears throat> which is great for anyone that's already operating um and again what that does is it flushes out anybody that isn't compliant i mean ultimately what what's asked of any any property owner or property manager in Scotland is they're asking for documentation that should already be in place. So, you know, we're, they're not asking for anything that beyond you, beyond, you know, that you should have been doing anyway. So um, by asking for that information, will ultimately move people out of the industry and it will move out the people that are non-compliant that have health and safety challenges with the property that aren't correctly maintaining them um and ultimately you know create a much cleaner stock base for the consumer um and again as i said in scotland the consumer demand ha hasn't changed as a result of this there will always be the demand so what we're doing is putting people into safer better maintained properties as a result um any new properties after the date of the after the date that this is introduced um will then need to apply for planning permission um and and that's roughly what the government has sort of said will come about and it is very um it is very high level the information that they've reduced that they've um given out to us and one of the things that they've also said is that they're going to be working on digital platforms now which obviously that that um infers that they're sort of creating that platform ready for you to be able to provide this document so you can apply you can add your property to the register now one of the questions you might have from that based on the planning in england uh, is well if they've created a new use class which is c5 and and there's a permitted development to allow you to move from a normal property, a normal residential property, into a uh, serviced accommodation, um, short-term let property to to change the use between those two, and you don't have to apply for full planning permission in order to do that. What's the point, right? The, the, there's no there's no sort of checks and balances there that allows the local authority to say, well, you can't do that. But what you can, what just to explain the planning system a little bit more, there's something called an Article 4 area. An article four. And an Article 4 area can remove that permitted development right. So each and every local council, because this, this use of C5 will be rolled out across the entire country. It'll be a blanket rollout. But then each and every single uh, individual council can then say, well, actually, we don't want any more short-term lets in this part of our city. Or in North Wales, where I know this kind of thing is a problem because... It's outpricing the locals from being able to buy houses there. 
those local councils can say, well, we don't want any more short term let accommodation in this part of North Wales, then the councils can put in those Article 4 areas, which means that if you want to apply to use a property as a short term let in those areas, you have to go through full planning. And therefore, if you're going through full planning, that gives that local authority the right to refuse that permission. And if you refuse that permission, I guess, if if you go through the same process in HMO, the planning department and the license do do talk to each other. I guess there's going to be a similar communication between the registration and between the planning permission, because part of that registration will be that you've got the correct planning code in order to use that property for short term accommodation. So they will talk to each other to make sure that they're, you know, you can't get a, get registered, but then you don't get planning, for example. Both of them will come will come together so long as you comply with what is required for both of those things. So that's how the local council will be able to say yes or no if you put planning permission in certain areas. Um, one question that I do have actually is how how we're talking about high density areas. Um, how will this affect the high density area of London, which already has a 90 day 90 night stay for serviced accommodation do you have any uh, any idea whether that will change Uh, it won't change but from what i can see uh from the government website is that that 90 day um being able to so if anybody has property in london you can let for 90 days uh, without planning they're looking to roll that out nationally so what this is designed to not impact is people that might go on holiday for a couple of weeks and let out a few rooms in their home or they might be away for a month and they want to generate revenue so they're they're making that allowance sort of nationally um but there's been nothing to say that that might change in london from what i've been able to understand so you'll be able to use your property if you live in a house and it's a c3 use class you'll be able to rent that out for up to 90 nights And uh, without having to change the use class to C5, is that correct? Potentially, yes. And I think that it's difficult because, again, they haven't, the government haven't expanded on how this will be implemented, the sort of intricacies of it. So uh, everything that, you know, we, we sort of, we know what we know, everything is potential. We can sort of learn from how it's worked in different areas um, and in different areas of the property industry to sort of assume how they might implement it. So what, um, we, we're going to, we're coming to the end now, so we need to wrap this up. So what I'll do is, um, this is just warning for everybody that's listening. If you've got any questions, please start typing them now. I'm going to hand over to Victoria to do like a, um, a summary um, or and also mention anything else that she feels is worthy of a mention. I know that, for example, capital gains tax is something that you've talked about previously, Victoria, so you might want to mention that. But this is the next five minutes that's just open for you to talk about anything specific that you want to mention that potentially we haven't mentioned before. And that gives everyone the opportunity to ask their questions. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much, Chris. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on was um, if there were potentially any proposals for Wales um yes there are uh rail whales excuse me sort of took the lead um on managing short-term accommodation with how they've implemented their um council tax charges uh but they are looking to follow the same type of registration scheme they've announced that they will have a registration scheme but they haven't given any time scales to that yet um Wales, if anybody is looking to start operating any short term accommodation in Wales, uh, there are some councils with some very interesting requirements. So I would say that irrespective of where your property is, you do need to contact your local council um, to ensure that, you know, your property is compliant with with sort of the local council's expectations. Um, Yes, I wanted to touch on... um, just the changes to tax, which it was a bit left field. We didn't necessarily see this coming. Everyone was focused very much on the legislation. But there are certain tax benefits um, that owners of, I will refer to them as furnished holiday lets because that's how they're referred to in law, uh, but short-term accommodation. Um, there have been some sort of changes where the, there was access to essentially a lot of benefits. Um so 
uh, just just to give you an overview, because regardless of how you refer to a property in the industry, a furnished holiday let for, for tax purposes, <laughs> um, it needs to be fully furnished. It needs to be situated within the UK um, or the European economic area as well. Um, different to business rates and council tax, it needs to be available for letting for a minimum of 210 days and be let out for a minimum of 105 days of the year. It's not got to be occupied by any long-term tenants um, for more than 155 days of the year, and it can't be occupied by a single tenant for more than 31 days of the year. So they're the requirements. If you have a property that falls into that bracket, um, then your property is classed as a furnished holiday let for tax purposes. Now, at the minute, as I said, there are a fair few benefits to this and the government is looking to implement changes coming in around 2025. So there's still the opportunity to unlock sort of financial potential for many of your properties. Um, so it is the first one is capital allowances. So at the minute, you can claim capital allowances for any furniture, equipment, purchasing, building, comfort, converting, refurbing costs uh, for your property. Um, but that's expected to end in April 2025 under these new rules. Um, with the planning changes, it's ass it's assumed that um, any property that fell under sort of the furnished holiday let bracket would be classed as a dwelling and it wouldn't have access to this. So there's the opportunity there if you are new to the industry or if you already have active serviced accommodation um, for you to sort of get, get your rewards out of there. Um, equally, capital gains tax. Um, at the minute, the capital gains tax rate is at 10%, uh, and this is likely to be no longer available on the sale of the property. Um, and the usual rate of sale for UK land and buildings will apply. So again, that that's uh, not very, very beneficial, but ultimately there's a period of time there before that's implemented. So there's still opportunity to get that potential out of your property. Um, and currently, if, if you are contributing to a pension, any owner of a furnished holiday let can make contributions to a personal pension fund, which will reduce your tax liability. And again, that's um, due to potentially end. This is all April 2025. So historically, if you've had, um, you know, a running serviced accommodation, it meets that criteria. There's still opportunity to get to get access to um, some revenue out of your property with that so there's still a bit more time on that with the english um legislation that's coming in place there is no time scales I've seen a few things that said summer i've seen something else that said autumn ultimately what they're trying to implement is a national scheme they're focusing on building out um digital platforms to do that you know, are we going to hand it to the government and say they're going to be slick and efficient with that? Potentially not, but they'll want to do it right. So I think that's why the information that they've released so far is quite light. It's very sort of top line. This is coming in, but they've not given any time scales for that. So again, if you're looking to move into the industry, if you're wanting to um, start operating a property as serviced accommodation, then now is potentially the time to do so. Another thing that I just wanted to touch on is that the criteria for serviced accommodation in Scotland, if you were operating as a property, um, you know, they were quite, quite clear on what that constituted. There hasn't been anything put forward by the government yet that is that says what they're going to use to identify a property as an operating short-term accommodation. So if it has to be operating for a certain length of time, if it has to be available for bookings for a certain length of time, there's all of that to consider. But ultimately, if that's the industry that you want to move into or you're operating in, um, just make sure you're absolutely getting the most out of your properties. So once that does come in, you know, you're showcasing to the government, you know, how, how you're operating this property and it can't be anything else other than serviced accommodation. Okay, great. Thanks very much. And we do have some questions that have come through. So um, I'll go through these. Um, Victoria, you can take a break and have a drink because I can cover the first question on my own. Uh, yeah. So the first question is, uh, what is the correct or favourable favorable legal structure for a rent-to-rent -rent business in light of changing regulations 
LLC versus LLPs. Now, that's a much bigger question than can be covered just by talking about the strategy that you're incorp- that, that you're going to be using. That question needs to incorporate you, all about you, your tax situation, your income situation, um, your uh, everything about your life. It, you know, that is a much bigger question than we than we can answer just by specifically talking about service accommodation, because you might operate exactly the same business as somebody else. But for one of you, the right the right answer is LLC, and for one of you, the right answer is LLP. Even though your business is is, is identical, your personal situation um, uh, changes. What is the best structure for you to use? Now, the best person to answer that question is your accountant, because your accountant is probably the only person in your life that has full transparency over all of your financial um, financial situation. Um, and because they have full transparency, they can make the most tax efficient uh, judgment as to what is the correct structure for you to use for serviced accommodation. Um, the one thing that I would mention just briefly for serviced accommodation when we're talking about tax is that don't forget that serviced accommodation income is vatable. So regular income uh, generated from a property where a family lives there is not subject to VAT because that's classed as, as rent, whereas serviced accommodation, accommodation income isn't currently classed as rent and it uh, the, the proposal is not to change that in any way. So if you go over the VAT threshold and in income that you make from service accommodation, then that you will need to start charging VAT for that. And again, your accountant should be able to suggest ways in which you can structure your business to kick that can down the street uh, compliantly for as long as possible. Um, anything you want to add to that, Victoria? Actually, I'll give you the opportunity to jump in. Uh, no, nothing to add to that. Excellent. Uh, So next question. Um, How did it affect properties you have in your own name, which are use which you are using as serviced accommodation? So uh, I'll cover that because we have we have a decent sized portfolio. Um, We don't currently operate any service accommodation ourselves with any of our portfolio. We do rent it out to people um, who who have been using it as serviced accommodation and have decided not to continue to use it as serviced accommodation. So we're, we're converting them. Well, not converting them because there's no no work needed. So we're taking them back and using them as normal buy to lets. We are still creating service accommodation units out of uh, some of the properties that we're we're converting at the moment, and we haven't yet decided whether we're going to hold them or whether we're going to flip those properties. So in terms of our normal business daily activities, not actually affected us much at all. Uh, we've taken some properties back, like I say, but we we originally took those properties on as normal buy to lets. So we knew that they worked as normal buy to lets and that metric doesn't change at all. Um, so it doesn't affect us in any way or hasn't affected us in any way. And we're still building those serviced accommodation units and whether we hold them or whether we flip them is still very much up for up for debate. So in terms of making decisions, the way that we make decisions is still very much based on the, the returns that we're generating rather than any, any legislation. Um, because I think as Victoria used this phrase previously, the, the legislation that's been put in place, the way that I see that is a barrier for entry for everybody else to get involved. But I'm prepared to go to, to do what's necessary in order to start using that property as serviced accommodation. So it's not a problem for me at all. Um, Victoria, do you want to jump in and answer that one or, or get involved in that one? Um, sorry, was that the question that you've just answered or the one that I've just read below about capital gains? Well, you should stop reading the questions. Um, no, it was about sorry, the one that I, know I just that was answered. Your job. Which was um, the, the the question was um, how is it affecting any properties that you own or manage uh, for service accommodation? Yeah, I, I think as Chris said, he's got a property, but it's not it's right to let. It's ultimately what you can get out of the property if you want to focus on serviced accommodation, and that's the route you want to go down, and that's how you want to use your properties. Then. Uh, the sensible thing to potentially do, and, and again, I'm not, not offering advice here, but sensible thing would be to operate them as serviced accommodation. So they'll be sort of scooped up un, under the new planning laws. And then if you need to change them retrospectively, that might be easier for you to do so. Yeah. Um. So that's that would be um my my if, if that was me, that would be my thought process if if I was committed to serviced accommodation. 
Absolutely. Uh, another question, is it still possible to run rent-to-rent -rent SA units? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Of course, you can still run rent-to-rent -rent SA units. However, you've now got more hoops to jump through. You've got more hoops to jump through, and now you've got a, a part of the council who is interested in your compliance. So you need to make sure that you are operating them compliantly, which means that you need to be more educated with what your local council is going to put in place and is going to demand of you. So stay, stay up to date with all of that information. Um, you know, what a lot of our franchisees will do is they'll share that information between themselves. So, you know, or I know the franchisees that we have together in, um, in Yorkshire, in one part of Yorkshire, they get together on a regular basis in order to, to talk about what's happening in their local area. Uh, we've got some other people in other parts of the country that do exactly the same. So network with people that are around your area that are involved in the kind of stuff that you're doing, just like our, our network does. Um, and, and, you know, stay in touch with what is changing so that you can stay compliant. But theoretically, can you still run, run rent to SA units? Yes, absolutely, you can. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Victoria? No, no, I think you've covered that off lovely. Great. Uh, and the last question, would you also talk about your network and what you can do for serviced accommodation operators? Well, you know, we've got 200 people throughout the country who we, who we have chosen to work with to help them make more money out of property. So they get a package of goods when they come and, and be part of Source. And that package of goods looks like training. It looks like support, which Victoria is obviously very heavily involved in. It looks like leads that we generate for them. And it also looks like funding that we can, we can give them in order to purchase properties. So all available under one roof. Now, in what that looks like for any individual person that's operating, it depends. It depends on, on what stage of that journey you're at. Because if you're right at the beginning of that journey, you may, you may lean very heavily on our training arm and you might spend a lot of time training to give yourself the knowledge. And then after a period of time, you might then lean on support to say, okay, so I've done the training now. Now I need you guys to help me implement that training because we're not just here to make sure that people are educated. We're, make, we're here to make sure that people implement their education. Now, if you're a bit further down the line and you're already op operating service accommodation, you might want to buy more units. Now our in-house funding uh, can help you purchase more units than you could from, you know, relying on mortgages, for example, because nine times out of 10, our in-house funding is able to, to lend you more money than you can get from a high street lender. So in, instead of having your targets of purchasing four service accommodation units in, in 2024, you might be able to purchase 10 service accommodation units in 2024 because we can help you make your money go further. So it, it, it depends how we can help you as to where you're at and what your ambition is. However, we've got a package of goods that is available to everybody to help them move forward. Now, we're going to send out an email after this. And in that email, there's going to be a link to our prospectus. Click on that link, have a look at the prospectus and see whether this package of goods that I'm talking about and some of the case studies that we've got in our prospectus that shows you how, how some of our franchisees have used, that, used those facilities to help them move forward much quicker with us than they could on their own see how that's helped them so um that's a, an email that we're going to send out afterwards and there's a link in there to the prospectus so click on that download yeah. that and then um and then have a look at how that will affect you and then by all means give us a call give us a call book in a meeting let's have a conversation and let's see if we can uh, if we can help you move forward faster and achieve more by being part of a team rather than doing it on your own um so that's it that's all the questions that we have so if i would like to uh, first of all Thank you, Victoria, for being uh, part of this. Thank you for your experience and your knowledge and for um, for sharing it with us. Not a problem at all. Thank you very much, Chris, for uh, asking the questions and being host with the most S. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and of course, thank you to everybody that's listened. Um, listen and either live or listen to the recording that we're going to uh, we're sending out to everybody so thanks very much for being part of this if you're doing service accommodation like i said before this is a movable feast so make sure that you stay up to date with your local authority as to what is happening but thank you very much for spending this wednesday afternoon with us and we'll speak to you soon thank you bye-bye thanks everyone